introduction of our event today. Um, my name is Jean Graham Jones. I'm a professor in the PhD program in theater and performance studies. And I want to, many of you have already heard some of the things I'm going to say, but since we've opened this up to the public and have more people, I'm going to repeat myself a bit, so bear with me there. Um, but I'm very pleased to be here in my capacity, not only as a faculty member, but the mentor for this year's student conference. And it's been created and organized by the student members of the Doctoral Theater Studies Association here at the Graduate Center. This year's conference, and it's the second one, we had a, we've had conferences over the year, but this is the second one in a row, so this is quite wonderful. Um, this year's conference theme is Objects of Study, Methods and Materiality in Theater and Performance Studies. And before I say a little bit about what people have been up to, although some of it's been behind closed doors and I too am unaware of what's been going on, I want to officially acknowledge um, the support we've received from the PhD program in theater and performance and the Cohn, Lortel, and Roberts chairs from the Graduate Center, the Doctoral Students Council, the Center for the Humanities, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. So thank you to all of those entities that supported this year's conference. And that's important also because one of the things that's quite wonderful about this conference is that it is free. Um, it's free to all participants and that is very much in the keeping with the CUNY, the history of CUNY, which began as a free university. This is one of the very few things left that's free, so we should be very happy and the students are to be commended for pursuing this, such a rare, open academic encounter. The conference is entirely student run um, and from everything from the selection of the theme to the design, the contents of the conference, the configuration of the rooms, the selection of the rooms, where your chairs are at this very moment. Um, the format is quite unusual and creative, and I'm very curious to see where we end up today. Uh, the organizers, I believe, have sought to create a structure that resonates with the theme. So really, really making changes to what we might consider to be a traditional conference structure. So we've had a provocative day already of intellectual engagement for groups broke into sessions. Uh, there were papers exchanged and commented. I was, I think I was the only person who dropped in on all four. So that was a, a lot of fun to see. Um, each of the members, well, four of the members of the organizing committee were paired themselves with four invited scholars who will be introduced momentarily. And the two of them ran each session. There was a lunch break provided by the students. And um, in the afternoon from two to four, these groups met again without the uh, invited scholar and have created, it was a session called Manufacture and they did manufacture something, which will be revealed to us very soon. <laughs> and I, I can't say anything more about it because I don't know anything more about it. I'm very excited to see that. So I'm going to introduce the five organizers of this year's conference and they're going to in turn introduce our invited scholars and the rest of the afternoon's activities. So, um, Elu Akinsi, Amir Farjoun, Sarah Lucy, Christine Snyder, Christine? She's busy organizing. She's, she's the one who's <laughs> actually making all of this happen and Corey Tamler. So I would like to give a round of applause for all five of them. So great. And thank all of you for being here with us. It's wonderful to have this turnout. So thank you, and I think we're gonna have some fun. Thank you, Jean. Um, and I will add to the thanks, thank you to Jean Graham Jones, who was our uh, faculty mentor. Um, so on behalf of the conference committee, I would like to welcome and introduce you to the four invited scholars who led our morning working sessions and will soon be featured in our evening discussion in these chairs you see before you. Um, so without further ado, and in alphabetical order, um, Catherine Behar. Uh, she is an interdisciplinary media and performance artist. She's also editor of Object Oriented Feminism, co-editor of And Another Thing, Non-Anthropocentrism and Art, 
and author of Bigger Than You, Big Data and Obesity. Um, she's also an associate professor of new media arts at Baruch College, CUNY. There you are, see. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> Uh, we also have Micah Bleeker, who is a theater studies professor, a dramaturg, and a translator at Utrecht. She is author of Visuality in the Theater and co-edited several volumes, including um, Anatomy Live, Performance and the Operating Theater, and Performance and Phenomenology, Traditions and Transformations, to name a few. <laughs> Uh, we also have Rebecca Schneider, who is Professor of Theater Arts and Performance Studies at Brown University with affiliate positions in the History of Art and Architecture and the Department of Modern Culture and Media. She is author of Theater and History, Performing Remains, and The Explicit Body and Performance, and she has edited multiple special issues of TDR, including one on new materialism and performance in 2015. <laughs> And last but not least is uh, So Young Yoon, who is Assistant Professor and Program Director of Art History and Visual Studies at the New School. She's also visiting Faculty of Critical Theory at the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program. She is at work on two book projects around the, re um, the redefinition of the document and the shift in its performative claims to the real. So thank you to all of you. Um, if you'd like to come join us up here while I explain what's going to happen next. <laughs> oh, everyone is so excited. Um, so we will. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, as was mentioned in our afternoon working sessions, we manufactured objects. And so what will happen next is we will turn to each um, student facilitator to, with the help of their working group, to present our object to our uh, scholar, who we were paired with earlier in the day. Um, and we'll also attempt to draw connections to each scholar's work by way of a little bit more of an introduction. Um, and this will then be followed by an open discussion between our invited scholars, moderated by one of our facilitators, Corey Tamler. Um, and just so you have a full outline of what is to come. Um, we'll then conclude that discussion with uh, breakout sessions rather than a more traditional Q&A so that everyone um, will break up into four breakout sessions so that we can have discussions with our scholars. Um, and each will be able to talk to two people. So there'll be two <laughs> sessions of 15 minutes each. Logistics, right? <laughs> um, Exactly, exactly. Um, so further instructions about that will come. But in the meantime, let's get started with the working group A and A. Lul presenting the object from Catherine Behar's working group. Hello, everybody. Um, so our morning discussion focused on the question of agency. And it was an unresolvable question for us. We, and we just like danced around it, so to speak. And so we wanted to tackle uh, a little bit more uh, with that concept because uh, one of the uh, doubts we had about the concept was that it's actually very um, in productive tension with the question of objectivity. And as scholars, that's something that we are very concerned with, so to speak, because we want to take care of our objects and describe it faithfully, so to speak. But does it give more agency to the object, in this case performance, or takes the agency out of it? Um, so I think that uh, concern dry, uh, drove us to develop statements about agency and affect and memory and objecthood. So um, agency was our center and everything else became um, a or, uh, orbited around it, so to speak. And uh, Catherine's um, w one of uh, Catherine's work texts actually touches upon how we dealt with it. So I want to present a quote before we present objects. Object-oriented feminism is on track for being beyond untrue in an erotic sense, in excess of singular truth. So it strives to be wrong, but not in the sense of being incorrect. Its promise is to be wrong as in being botched, 
as in, girl, that's all wrong. Flat indifference to correctness. Being wrong in this way is radical, political work. It means setting aside truth and correctness in favor of being artificial and botched, all to make room for neurotics of generative thinking and doing. The underlying vagar is that right thinking gets worked out in the doing of the making. Only in willingness to be all kinds of wrong can we arrive at being in the right, in the ethical sense. So we want to produce our objects that touch upon this method of being wrong and the question of agency. <laughs> So this is our statements in a bottle, because we wanted to make use of the bottles, because we are green, right? Like Anthropocene, guys. Um, so on each scrolls, we have statements about agency. So if you can pick one and just open it, that would be cool. But if you don't want to do it, that's also fine. Yes? Okay. Um, well, no. no. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Wow. It's a big message. So this object says, care is treatment. Treatment is a relationship, parenthetically, perhaps, influenced by memory. Care occurs in time. It is performed and, performance, and performative. Respect, respectful attention is a perform of care. <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> I just want to show the, uh, okay. Interpretation or um, interation or interpretation is care equals activating over creating. Memory, and then there's a, an algorithmic formula um, <laughs> that says something, FR, um, is to take hold and inter is to hold between. Cruelty is a relationship, care, above care. Cruelty is a relationship above care. So. A message on care. This was one of the one of the main points of discussion today. So. Um. <laughs> well, I, uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> I feel like this is a game show. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying things out. You know, okay. Bear with us. It's um, but I agree that objects okay. are a bit clumsy. Um, should I sit? I don't know. Um, so, Mike Blicker, thank you very much for coming. Don't worry, I won't uh, embarrass you too much. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, on our group, in our group, we there was a, you gotta help me out. Um, we were kind of fumbling for a, for a, for a sense of what do we want by um, objects, and it goes. For us, it's kind of clear that when we talk about objects, we don't necessarily talk about you know, material stuff and that we can offer um, something that's not uh, there in a material sense, a uh, tangible material sense. And, but the discussion, I think, really kind of hit um, a traction point when we introduced the connections of to object and um, and an objective, and so uh, as an as objects as things that are activating uh, relations of affective um, 
um, caring uh, interest um, between uh, two different things. So a certain sense of intensities uh, between those um, that, that, that constitutes an object. And while an object doesn't have to be material, it is in this time, so I'm just going to bring it. So uh, the way that this happened um, is that we began to talk about Eros, but there was a misunderstanding, and somebody heard arrow. Eros uh, is an arrow. And exactly, an Eros is an arrow. And from that slip, um, the object of an arrow as uh, something that penetrates, moves in space, connects things, makes love, uh, kills. Um, that happened. <laughs> um, this is made out of the folders that held uh, the program of our day and of our own uh, papers. Um, and you will also find that it's, um, it, it's a double speared arrow uh, for, I hope, kind of obvious and maybe also good reasons. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have an introduction, so everyone can just join me up here. Correlating the relationships between toothbrush and man. The toothbrush inserted itself in the scene points to its own vibrancy. Orange smiley. <laughs> While I identify the chair as an object rather than as various pieces of wood and metal, why should the chair identify itself the same way? <laughs> Perhaps the strand beasts will wander on Dutch beaches long after humans have disappeared from the planet. That is precisely what makes them critical as an act of performative speculation. Alien emoji. <laughs> the presence of the camera does not erase the physicality of the body. Both the camera and the body coexist in the somatic place of the dancing body. Crown emoji. Ecology as ontology in which individual causal agency is muddied in the tangled relational field. Barad asks how the indeterminacy and contingency of bodies requires the see no evil monkey emoji. <laughs> Emotional affective manipulation. In the text, the affective tug is just as effective as logic itself. Transmedial praxis of managing bodies, space, and rhythm produced an aesthetic defined by the empathetic animation and deactivation of energy, affect, and motion. Animal performance, then, has the capacity to facilitate human recognition of logic and value systems that do not place humanity at the center. Frog emoji. <laughs> Papers made from the cellulose fibers that are present in hardwood and softwood trees. Whether using wood or recovered paper, the first step is to dissolve the material into pulp. Regardless of the type of pulping process used, the wood or recovered wood is broken down into its component elements so that the fibers can be separated. 
Pulping results in a mass of individual fibers being produced. The fibers are then washed and screened to remove any remaining fiber bundles. The water is then pressed out and the residue is dried. I'm gonna let you hold that. <laughs> <laughs> by, by way of explanation, um, we chose quotes from each other's papers um, and arranged them um, temporally by how we experience them during the day. Um, but in our working group, we were really inspired by questions that were coming up about an object's existence um, depending on its relationship to time, a, an object only existing in time. Um, as well as thinking about the potential of performance um, to materially rehearse or embody or envision um, different relationships between human and non-human objects. Um, so what we turn to you again. So um, in your discussion in the article Objects in Our Hands um, in the Performance Philosophy Journal, um, you discuss how the interval um, entangles us cross-temporally in human and non-human relationships. Um, and so our, a question to you that we pose for when we um, open up the discussion is, um, if we are hailed by recycled gestures and material relationships from history, um, can speculative performance materialize the future in any way? Um, and what would that performance actually want from us? So thank you. Um, hi, so can I ask my, uh, my working group to come up and help unfold our object? Um, and it may be a little fragile, I don't, it may, it may come apart a little bit. Um, so, oh, it held up pretty well. Um, it can go multiple ways. <laughs> So hopefully you'll, you'll have a chance to look at this a little bit closer. Maybe we can pull it closer to So Young. Um, and you'll all have a chance to look at it a little bit more closely when we, uh, when we break out into groups. But uh, basically, um, in our morning discussion, we, we all felt really challenged by and excited by and provoked by um, some of the questions that uh, So Young, you raised. Uh, for us, for all of the papers about um, about the the connection between language and communication, and thinking about language as more than communication, going beyond communication, um, and also all of the papers in in our working group uh, evidenced some kind of interest in archives or in um, in in memory or future archives and this sort of relationship with, with, um, between object and, uh, and memory and the archive and futurity. And so, um, and then we also talked a lot about, and you brought in some of your own work with overdetermined objects and that, and that was a, a discussion that we had. So we sort of combined all of these ideas and created an archive of overdetermined words. Um, <laughs> And the, the process by which we created this was uh, we, we started by just writing down as many of these overdetermined words as we could think of. So I can just read out a couple of them. Um, aporia, uh, <laughs> flesh, object, genealogy, uh, Hegelian, <laughs> sign, index. Um, and so we, we wrote down first sort of as many as, as we could think of and then we, uh, we spread out this piece of paper and we started to arrange them in clusters. So in, instead of giving ourselves a, a structure, a predetermined structure for how the archive would look, uh, we let the words tell us where they wanted to be in relationship to one another. Some of them got moved, that's where these lines are. And we also, it was a very associative and very affective exercise for us. So we continued to write words as we went along and this archive could of course extend indefinitely. Um, and one thing that I wanted to pull out then from 
our discussion sort of after we created this, this archive uh, was that we all sort of realized and agreed um, that A, this sort of brought home to us the materiality of these words, these words as objects, um, and also that they were heavy objects. I think as Z put it, that, um, that, we, uh, that we had this experience when one of us would, would place a word and say, because we would read the words aloud as we place them, oh, identity, and place it next to queer and epistemology and heteronormative, and everyone else would go, ah, yes. <laughs> and the word would sort of land with that weight. Um, so that is our, that is our archive of overdetermined words. And thank you for being such a generous discussant this morning. Um, and I'm already up here, so uh, <laughs> round of applause for all of the groups for being such good sports. Um, and I am, I think I have my questions with me. I'm gonna grab water. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit up here and be the physical stand-in for all of us as student facilitators. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, and so I will, I'll moderate the discussion and help move it along, but I have questions uh, that all four of us have written together. Um, but we also don't have to get to them. We'd love to just start with any responses that the four of you have <laughs> to the objects. Don't feel pressure to respond. It's not, it is not a game show despite appearances. Um, but we'd love to hear any responses that, that you do have either to the objects or, and, to, and how they resonate with your own work and, and how you think about the, um, the focus of this conference. Well, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I think it's an incredible object that you created out of our discussions, and I think it's very uh, accurate, actually, representing what we've been talking about. I'm quite amazed by that, because we talked a lot about objects in terms of relations, or how objects could maybe only not un be understood in terms of relations, relations between objects, but maybe also objecthood as a set of relations, now that objects are not necessarily physical, also, so they're ne not necessarily there. And I really like the kind of undecidability of this object. Where is the relation going? Or is it going that way or that way? Or is it hold, holding, holding together something that tries to go in both directions? Um, and, and, and I think that was, uh, yeah, that was something that kept coming back. And, um, and also, in a way, I think it was very interesting to see that from that perspective, we could relate so many different objects and also think about objects is something that um, is co-produced by people thinking about objects or by doing research, by um, looking at things. So it was also about ourselves as part of the kind of cutouts that then become objects. Um, and, and I mean, it, I think in a way you could also even see it as a, it's, it's kind of this double-edged sword, but it's also, you could also think about the, the um, the, the kind of the, the love for the object, a little cupido, but then the <laughs> um, <laughs> with the arrow. So it, it, I think it's um, kind of amazing how you uh, made a summary of a discussion in, in the terms of an object. I mean, that's really taking the, th the theme seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll pick up on that then, um, that I feel like if this is about uh, relationality, these um, <laughs> these messages in bottles um, that are that are left all but the one are left unread um, are maybe about the um, the separateness of objects and their non-relationality. That that in the sense that an object might be contained in um, what Graham Harmon would call a, a black box, right? that does not um, readily yield to, uh, to interpretation, which was one of the themes that we were talking about. I think it's really, um, it's humorous to me that these black boxes are actually transparent. So I think that when, one of the things that we were, we were talking about was, um, I, mean, I think we were very undecided on this question of access and of um, interpretation and this sort of hermeneutic uh, relation of the object. And I think that the, um, there's also something about this excess, right? That there's more, there's more objects than 
I am able to read in the time that I have, right? <laughs> so that there's something about the communicative potential of the object being, um, being sort of a reserve, a surplus that's held in reserve. Um, in terms, now I feel that I have to respond to the, <laughs> the being wrong of these objects. So I will just respond with an anecdote that when we were just at our coffee break, I was told that these objects would be phallically vertical. And yet when they were laid at the feet of the feminist, <laughs> somehow they went horizontal. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um. Today was just a real pleasure and a real joy. Fabulous conversation um, around and about fabulous papers. Um, there was, you know, we asked everyone to sort of host their paper into the space and kind of talk about what they wanted to bring out of the paper. And so many really interesting ideas kind of came out of the paper and then circulated among us. And, you know, we sort of breathed the collective air of these papers and let the ideas commingle, uh, you know. Um, and thinking about lots of different things, lots of different questions that were brought up by the papers, like why performance um, in relationship to um, what, what could be said to be the pressure to unthink or think ourselves out of, if not demolish, the kind of killing um, or at least deeply constricting habit of constantly distinguishing subject and object. Um, the, 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 the habits which maybe, you know, theater and our different media in different ways have been scripting us along um, for many years, the habit of um, falling into uh, um, comfortable, except deeply uncomfortable habits of um, subjects in relation to objects, objects in relation to so-called subjects. And we talked about scrambling those, and we talked about um, both kind of the issues of, of the autonomies of the object, but also um, the and inscrutabilities of the object, but also the impossibility of autonomy um, and the ways in which um, objects um, a, a request us uh, to come undone in relationship to them. Um, and one of the ways that we might come undone in relationship to them is to stop thinking of ourselves um, as subjects. Um, but on the other hand, there's a sort of pressure to stop thinking of objects as objects um, and, the, and the tension about whether we want a subjectful uh, world um, or an objectful world, or if the question are about, as Ashan Crawley talks about, the aesthetics of possibility for thinking otherwise and, and how we think otherwise. Um, so I find we also talked about history in relationship to that, as, as was said. I, I love it that the object that you presented for me was really a performance. Um, and and th there is a residue here of performance, and it's a residue of a performance that contains also your papers and our discussions in a very literal way, because we talked about literalization. Um, there are the papers returned to me and requesting of me if objects, quote, hail us, as we talked about. I know what to do. We said, you know what to do with the object. <laughs> and you've presented me with an object about which I know what to do. I am to drink the <laughs> contents, <laughs> and yet, right, and yet. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I will be performing that with us here today. Um, on the other hand, it also really suggests that we always already do ingest each other's thoughts and ideas and papers, and that the best kinds of things happen through that sort of digestion. We talked about you know, air that we breathe collectively, um, and, and the sort of coming inside and outside of, of our bodies in relation um, and subject and objects in relation. So um, I just want to thank you for this extremely, um, yeah, you did it with this object, <laughs> and I feel challenged by it. Um, and I'm grateful to you all for the great discussion today, so thank you. Um, to, to follow up on that briefly, I, mean, I love that point about the, the the weight of these words, like, and how it lands, and then there's this collective awe, like, and what does it mean to share, like, in that moment of, of, of a very embodied thought, like, where the, these words that, I mean, um, I was particularly mindful of reading these papers that were shared with me beforehand, that a lot of the students, um, that it was from the position of a student, of someone who is studying, and trying to define what that object of study is, namely the conference, but also within a, a, a graduate program. And I should just mention that um, I've just come from a campus where our student workers are on strike. I'm at the new school. So the condition of learning <laughs> is, is very, 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 um, we are negotiating that as we speak.
speak, and it creates a kind of proliferation of words, what it means to even bring that condition forward. So um, I was particularly mindful of that question of study, and it's, it's really wonderful to come right after also this performance where like, there's the pulping, like, and then there's this explosion. Like, there was, there's a wonderful resonance here. Um, I mean, in our discussion, uh, while I was reading, and there was a really interesting um, thread that kept on running throughout the uh, participants' papers. On one level, this question of what it means to queer or decolonize the archive, but the archive itself is, as, it's, as, as a stand-in, as a representation for the, the body of the state. What does it mean to, to have a mimetic relationship to that archive, one in which we don't, we speak to uh, the logics of inclusion and exclusion, but don't try to then repeat like the, uh, the inclusion of the excluded object, like um, just by repeating that logic of inclusion and exclusion again. And then also to move from that, this question of, of what it means to set up a relationship between, uh, um, between the actual like, and the virtual, which itself like, seemed to uh, overlap like with other kinds of dichotomies that go on top of the actual versus the material, like the, uh, the actual versus the virtual, the index like versus like the, 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 the indexical versus the digital. So what does it mean to be in a media environment like or an, a, a media ecology in which the, the so-called object has more felt like presence, like materiality or ur urgency than perhaps uh, uh, more previous forms of, of accounting for our, our state of being. And so in this way, I'm continuing some of this discussion. I think um, in our panel, one of the questions that came up was, at least for me, what I found very interesting is if we, on one level, this question about mimesis, like is that what does it mean as a writer, as a student, as one who tries to write about, like uh, write about these objects in a way that gives attention to or attune, an extra attunement to its materiality? How does that change our, our, our writing? Like, and what does it mean to not then lapse into theoretical conceits or analytical traits or interpretive habits that put, like, that establish a distance with that object? Like, as a study, what does it mean to be performative? Not just talk about the performativity of the object, but actually to perform that, perform that relationship in the act of writing itself. Like, so um, the position of the reader. Like that also meant that, and I think for me, my own interest was, I'm, I come out of my own work deals a lot with leftist discourse in which one of the key conventions was the notion of a subject of history. But so if we are going to momentarily suspend these notions of, of a subject of history that is coming to redeem us, like, then what kind of verbs, tenses, like sentence structure will be used to, to speak to our moment? And I felt that this conference in part was about uh, maybe questioning some of the um, habits like in which we talk about subjects of history, like in a very redemptive or uh, in the stance of a critical stance. And how do we change that mode of critique and also change our, our, our habits of writing in which we, we um, well, we, I, like cross the I, cross the we, so that we are less in a position of maybe interpretation or even expression, but almost a kind of possession like with the object. So um, I could speak more, but uh, it was a wonderful morning session. And um, it was really wonderful to think through. And this is, this is amazing, yes. I'm glad you think so. Um, thank you all for the for those lovely responses to the objects. Um, I have some more sort of general broadening questions now, so we can sort of I mean we can always return to the objects; they'll be here with us. Um, but we can also leave them behind uh, and sort of broaden the discussion a little bit more. Um, and you can go wherever you want to with these questions. Um, but the first one is from Sarah. Uh, so so Sarah would like to know. <laughs> uh, what are the tensions? <laughs> what are what are the tensions between thinking the human as object versus the human as matter or material, and are these designations irreconcilable? That's Sarah's question.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the question is, what are, I, I do, I feel like I'm saying this like we're on a game show. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what's happened. Um, I'll try to stop. Uh, so, so the question is, what are the tensions? <laughs> that every time. Um, what are the tensions between thinking the human as object versus thinking the human as matter or material? And are these two designations able to be reconciled? Are they irreconcilable? <laughs> Does it make sense? Well, there's a lot, I think there's a lot that you could say about it. I mean, there's a, a lot of different places you could take that. I mean, I would have to sort of ask you, what is at stake in the question for you? But what, what comes up for me would be, you know, our sort of habits of the way that we think about object as a sort of passive or inert or non-agential. Obviously, I suggest with many others that we overcome our habits of that. Um, and we think of material as sort of given to be created into something else. So material habitually we think of as components as, as future as a component part of some other future being um, or you know given to alteration in some way so um, in a way you're asking what is it to mean to think of the human as the conventional object which is passive or or, or given to be um, non-agential versus thinking about human as material which is given to change to become or to in some other way become a, a component of something else. So I think even in phrasing the question that way, it, it would seem to be that we might prefer to think of the human as material. Um, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I myself am not 100% convinced that thinking in terms of, of objects is, um, yeah, that's sort of what we're supposed to do at this conference. But, um, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to undo the statistic, the, you know, the statistic in a sense of that. But you may have something to say to that. Go ahead. I, yeah, maybe I'll, I would offer. A, so I, first of all, I don't think that these things are um, are incompatible. I just want to say that up front. Um, I think that actually, like the challenge is to hold all of these ideas together. You know, um, but if I had to, in our game show, um, <laughs> stake a <laughs> stake a position. Um, I would say that it is my, um, what I find more useful in my thinking um, is to think about the human as object. Um, and part of that is a way of, um, I mean, this is a, a huge part of the discussion that we were having this morning, and I want to thank, I want to take a moment to thank my, gr my group because we had a really wonderful and productive morning session. But um, part of the, Part of that is to, to help to undermine this conceit of agency um, that I think we, we want to question, or I want to question. I want to question the extent to which um, humans are actually um, agents with volition um, today. And one of the things that uh, we were just talking about was um, this shift in, in from ooh to oof, right? It, the, the O that's dropped and replaced with the F is the O for ontology. So for me, this is really specifically um, historical, right? It's specifically about context. Um, I'm not trying to make an ontological claim when I say that humans are objects. I'm saying that this is a historical um, context in which, yes, I think humans are objects, and I think that in order to do politics now, we need to understand and actually like embrace and embody performatively that objecthood. Well, maybe maybe also in line with that, I think my, my question I, I would respond with a question probably like what if, if you so is conceiving humans as object, what kind of objecthood do you and, so I think it makes more sense to think about if, in what situation we, do we conceive humans as objects and what kind of objecthood is that? And in, and in what way does the human matter or how does the human matter materialize in certain situations? So it's, I, I'd like to, to active, make it more an active uh, gesture than, an, than because object and material matter, it, it suggests as if 
these are given, whereas we're also always implicated in that, and they change in different situations. And then I think there can be very crucial questions. And how, how, do, how are humans objects in, in certain situations? What is, what is their objecthood? And, and, and how do they matter and materialize in certain situations? Well, uh, okay, I mean, I, I think, I think um, it, it's not as though humans have not been objects, obviously, and as we, as we sort of think about the foundation of the human, right, which if we are um, reminded by Sadia Hartman, for instance, or that, you know, the, the, the mobility of the human is founded on, in terms of the liberal subject position of man and, and manhood, is founded on the rendering of black objects. Um, and so the question is not, it, you know, the question is what, what is the answer to that? To sort of liberate everybody into humanhood that is not an object or the becoming object project. But either way, one has to think oneself outside of the subject object relation, which maybe this material versus object is masquerading as. Um, and if it's masquerading as another way to think subject object, I think we have to not do it. Um, and again, have to, think, have to think otherwise, have to think to the side or slant in some way. Of that, of that, of that equation, and and I'm more interested in the sort of I guess intra agentiality. Somebody like you know what Barad is thinking about 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 intra objects or, or objects always in in a relation of, of co becoming. Um, that that I guess you could say that makes humans objects, um, but it, you could just as well say that that makes objects subjects. I mean we. Let's find another way to sort of think about this. And I think that's why making objects or writing poems or <laughs> some other kind of formation, um, like the literalization um, that we talked about in our group, um, is, is interesting and compelling. So yeah, that's my answer to that, or, or further complication of, of that problem. I'm not sure I can add more to what's already been said, other than the fact that um, just in my own practices, like I've never particularly found like ontological questions, like a good place to, to, I mean, I mean, there is a way in which when we talk, uh, so uh, a different way of saying this is that um, I found, uh, in particularly regarding this human as object, this human as material and matter, I'm not quite sure I've ever thought about it in quite those terms, like, but I, I would find the latter more productive or, or useful <laughs> just in my own writing. I think part of it is, is that, um, and this is, um, in one level is that often in our discussion, and this would of course be changing the conventions about the way we talk about objects, is that often discussing subjects, objects often get into like, as you said, like questions about agency and, and what it means to problematize those notions of agency. I think, um, I mean, I, I think this, so many of our discussions are, are but we, st we still pivot around agency. <laughs> so. Like, I, I would love to just suspend like questions about agency like for a while like and and one way to suspend like and slow that down is actually to start talking about what we mean by by human like the components the matter the material to break it down what does it do like and that's where I find the material question more interesting not that I'm 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 I'm, I'm trying to avoid but it's just that um, it's that either it's just that the question about agency already locks us into a certain kind of, um, or it tends to, like, in a, to certain kind of debates about politics and economy. And if that's the debate we're having, fantastic. But then, but then we start to have to talk about what kind of categories of human, like, have been like distinguished by objects. And so, question exactly. So, in that sense, like. Uh, adding on to the answers that came before, the one way to uh, ultimately enter into that question is maybe having to go through like the matter, the material of the human to actually finally get to like a different notion of objective. Um, we also, we, we kind of wanted to push on actually um, these, uh, these questions about uh, uh, what are the implications of um, of some of these designations for doing politics, sort of the political implica implications of uh, so the things you started to bring up, Catherine and um, and you, so young. So um, so and this question comes from Elul, but the political she's asking about the political impl implications of designating the human 
as object or, or as material in a time when um, the paradigm of production is more, is increasingly more immaterial and human bodies and life worlds are increasingly disposable. Um, so the designations we were just talking about, what, is, what does that mean for then politically? And yeah, well, I'll, I'll, there's a second part to the question, but it, that might be enough <laughs> to start with. <laughs> Anyone hear the second part of the question? Sure. Can we yeah, have the, the whole thing? Absolutely. Yeah. The second. The second part is, um, uh, or the, or is maybe just an elaboration of the first part. But um, but but uh, the second part is what's what's the relation between Marxist historical materialism and new materialism, in the context of aesthetics and politics of performance? <laughs> Simple, easy, easy question. <laughs> okay. Can we go back to the first part? <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe, okay, maybe I will start by addressing the first part. I, I guess I think that, um, well, I think that actually this question about like the, the immaterial labor um, is actually key because I, and to me, you know, coming, we also discussed this in my group. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm repeating things for my group. So, um, but for me, coming as a performance practitioner, but not necessarily a scholar of performance studies, right? Um, I have a whole slew of disciplinary questions about methodologies, about um, disciplinary perspectives. Um, but one thing that um, I latch onto is this kind of performance of work, the performance of labor. Um, and that's one way that for me in. And I think that this kind of um, the so-called immaterial labor um, question, I think this ends up, um, for me, this is, this is part of why this is, I think, coming up now historically. And again, for, for me, this is, I mean, I do want to have that question, that conversation, you know, about politics because I think that the ontological idea of this is like, this is the way the world is kind of like, this is the state of being that's transhistoric. To me, this doesn't make any sense to me. But I do think that this sort of, I mean, we've seen across multiple fields um, an interest in objects, an interest in material. I, and I think it's because these things feel like they're slipping away in our lives, even, um, even things like identity, right? We were talking about this during the break. So I think that as these, um, as these things that once maybe were more concrete start to feel more remixable and more immaterial and more slippery, I think that there is this interest in understanding what, what is the object. And I think that that has to do with our conditions of labor and our conditions of, uh, you know, capitalist circulation of self. I'm not sure we can be done with the question of agentiality if we are going to really take seriously the, quote, old materialism in relationship to the, quote, new materialism. I'm not a fan of newness. I think it's um, really <laughs> been a, to the service of a kind of particular trajectory of development that um, the progress idea that the new materialism will get us out of the problem <laughs> that the old ma and old materialism couldn't, and we have to just jettison that as well, I think. Um, because of course, you know, I think we, you, it's possible to read um, Marx as incredibly important um, in terms of the question of the agencies of objects um, in, and in relationship to the sort of de-agentification in some ways of, of humans um, or their inter-agential relations. In other words, that, you know, there's the idea that um, um, an object in a commodity relation is, is you know, uh, it takes over from, I mean, becomes the human, in a sense, stands in for the human relation. And the human is the sort of servant, in a sense, of the object, and flips that equation of, of, of passivity and agentiality, um, it, where the humans are actually in the position of being um, subservient to a kind of phantasmagoria of, of object orientation. Um, 
So uh, I also think that, you know, thinking a little bit about this component issue, which, which really is about an, inter, an intra in animation of objects and humans in assemblages, um, is key, and, and I think it, one can read Marx that way, that Marx is really thinking about, um, if you read, reading closely, you know, the, how many times Marx will write about objects moving hand to hand to hand, mm -hmm. and there's a, a question of objects in circulation with hands, with, with, with manual, you know, with, with, which are not humans and are not necessarily, but, but there's, a, you know, a real invitation, I think, to, to think closely with that. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, we talked about it in our group a little bit, about the, 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 the problem, I'm, it, I recently read about it through um, Juicy Perica's Geology of me Media, um, he picks up from Benjamin Bratton, but the idea of the, the, the little piece of coal can that's in the middle of everybody's iPhone that we carry into, in around in our hands, um, an object in our hands, or called a handy in Germany, right? But the point is that his, he, he, this allows Perica to make the argument that media is a billion years old because that bit of mineral is in the phone. Um, but it also, it also reminds us, I think, that um, like, like Toni Morrison said, it's in your hands. So there's that, you know, and, and, and the, the, the passing that happens of between objects and humans. And, but it also reminds us that that coal can comes to us through the labor of miners in Africa. And, the, you know, I think it's a very important question as to whether what remains of the handedness of the miners, right, in the, in, in the coal can is there, but is the labor there as well? You know, that congealed labor, um, which, Marx, which, which is what Marx gives us. Um, so I think, yeah. Old, new, let's s still think with Marx, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was thinking, but I'm, I'm not quite sure if I can kind of phrase it as kind of yeah, well elaborated as what, what you, how you just expressed also the relationship to the, the very concrete materiality and the importance to take that also. I was wondering about the immateriality. I'm, I'm not sure. It, it's how we like to think about a lot of things. Well, there's a tendency to think that a lot of things are immaterial, but they're the result of very material uh, kind of practices. And I think what you just pointed out in Parika's uh, geology is, is also pointing to that. And there is, it, it, I think what we maybe are facing is that there is a lot of very material communications going on to which we don't have access. But it's not immaterial, it's very material. But it is, um, it, it, and it requires even more taking into account um, how, how different objects, humans included, how they can communicate and, and, and what their possibilities of sensing are, what their possibilities of relating are, uh, and, and to be aware that, that we're not the center from which everything is visible or from which we have the overview. And maybe that is uh, something that um, was not so much part at that time of, of Marx's perspective, but is just also related to a time and, and trans uh, technological transformations since then. It is not a discontinuity, but it is a new take on it, I think, in, uh, in, in several ways. Do you want to, I, I, I just, I, I feel like I want to, you know, I want to implicate myself in saying that I am, you know, I ascribe very much to the commodity fetish um, read from Marx, but I also think that it's really important to um, to recognize how the idea of labor um, congealed in objects does not take into account um, slave labor, and that this you know that's not accounted for um, by the commodity fetish idea, and that uh, that slave labor of humans literally being objects, being commodities is also um, what founds the idea of the human, right? It's, it's concurrent with the idea of the human, this um, transatlantic slave trade, which I just heard someone brilliantly saying, we need to use different language because the ocean was not trading in slaves. Select European nations were trading in slaves, right? So this, I think that it's really important to also recognize that legacy when we're talking about um, about the human and the non-human and the object of materiality. And perhaps on that note, I think it's um, 
discussions about racial capitalism have been, especially the return, I think, um, in, in the last decade, like a return to, um, with a renewed kind of historical focus on the absolute um, necessary relationship between transatlantic slavery and industrial capitalism. I think some of the um, works like, like a book like Saltwater Slavery, for example, that very specifically marks that our imagination of mechanical labor is a bit problematic because the assembly line cuts too short. Like, is that it's not just the the alienation and exploitations that are happening within the Manchester factories, but they are directly connected to the exploitations that are happening in the plantations. And I think part of the implication is that, and this is absolutely in Marx, that that capitalism cannot function like without like with, without a certain kind of uh, presumption of cheap nature to exploit. So there's a difference between labor and value. Like, and, and I think one of the, um, so this is in relationship to our discussion right now. I'm trying to, like, the, um, I mean, um, I'm, uh, maybe I'll, hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So it's, it is. yes, it, it's, I was trying to think about the political question, and it's something that I find myself constantly shifting, uh, wearing two hats, and it's hard for me to actually reconcile. <laughs> like one is, and this somewhat tracks like which Marx I'm reading. Like am I reading Marx of the Communist Manifesto, so the Marx of class struggle, where we are talking about subjects of history, and we are talking about the proletariat. Or are we reading Marx of Capital, where the term proletariat does not really appear? And so there's a position of like Marx after the, the Paris Commune, like, and are we talking about from the position of class struggle and resistance, or are we talking about the position of the system? Like, and there are two very different kinds of um, political narrativization that takes place if you're focusing on the dyna dynamism, like, of a, of a struggle, like, as opposed to the, the seeming permanence, like the object nature of a system. And it seems that in, at least in the discussions that I had with my group this morning, we were talking not so much about from the position of class struggle, like, but actually what does it mean to talk from within the system through the logic of the system and how do you give form to the system? Like, and in a sense, what is the kind of strategy at work or rhetorical strategy at work even in the writing of Marxist capital where he's shifting gears, like even the discussion about commodity fetishes and what does it mean to take very seriously capital self-representation of itself because these representations are never just neutral or are they just ineffective? Like so, uh, so for me that's why they are, they're, they're act, like, it's not an aporia, like, and I think I do believe in the dialectic, but, but that there are two very different positions like in which we engage the political like and I have not found a way to to um, reconcile them in one essay so I, I wear two different hats and it also means my writing style changes like my voice changes and like it's just it's just um, there's no consistency like from the two modes so yes I mean there is that question of, of refusal in a sense like what is what is 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 refusal and can one even refuse the topic of politics in some way? Like I think you can't refuse that, but refusal itself as a very, and the question of the resistance of the object. And one can think about that in terms of something like Fred Moten's work on resistance of the object, but also somebody like Luce Irigaray, who writes about commodities amongst themselves, who quote, refuse to go to market. And that is obviously a political refusal um, and whether it's possible or not is another question, but also Irigaray is old, too, with the new feminist materialism, <laughs> but nevertheless, there's that, that, that definite kind of objects amongst themselves, i.e. prostitutes or women, um, refusing a certain object relation. Um, yeah. Uh, we, well, uh, our intention was to move, I mean, the, the discussion is, it, I, in some ways feels like it's it's just getting started. So we could continue for uh, for the rest of our time or we could move into these breakout sessions, which was our uh, um, our I, I, our replacement for um, a for an audience uh, for an open audience question. Um, so I, I think I think we might want to yeah, I think we'll move on, we'll move to um, 
sorry, <laughs> we're, we're, mid, we're mid figuring out with, a, with limited amount of time. Um, at, but, great. I have a sense that we should continue this. There are some other questions and then there's other people. Um, but, but also, the, the good thing about breaking into having break, break sessions, and, and if, if it's okay that we are improvising. Um, the good thing about the breakout sessions is that everyone can uh, choose to uh, ask and speak directly with uh, one, two, actually. Uh, scholars that um, of 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 whose work you are interested in, and uh, that was the that was the thought behind that. Uh, but there's also force, I guess, in unity, <laughs> um, and 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 that tensions of you know uh, as thoughts progress. So that's why we were kind of uh, steering last moment to say let's 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 continue. Um, is there any consensus in the room, one, one way or the other? All you objects want to do. <laughs> Keep it up. Should we, should we take some, maybe there are questions from the audience? Yeah, we can, we can, we can take I some questions like from the audience. A, <laughs> um, does, does someone want to pass my yeah. Uh, interesting conversation here. Uh, I've been, I'm a documentary filmmaker and I've been doing a documentary on the state of empathy and one of the things I've been thinking about and talking to people about is about objectification, how they, talking about objects and how people objectify themselves and how they objectify each other. And, and in thinking and listening to your conversation, I kept on thinking about what makes us human and from objects is our empathy when we p infuse empathy into something, it then all of a sudden it becomes alive. Uh, otherwise, it's just a, a thing, a material thing. I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, I guess your observation po points to, uh, to the sense of relationality that is required to understand how if we, if we want a different way of thinking about objects, that it's not only a, a, a matter of things over there, but that we, become, that we take more into account how we, how we cannot think what, how objects appear, what their objecthood is, independent from ourselves being involved with, with these objects, and how there is a deep relationality. And in that sense, how all the, the questions about objects that we have been addressing here, um, I kind of automatically imply rethinking subjects re and, and imply rethinking relationships between them and, uh, and, and, and question the givenness of objects. I think that's a very fundamental thing that we were constantly kind of, yeah, observing that uh, it, it's, it's not a redefinition of a thing over there, but it is a redefinition of, of whole ecologies in which things emerge as objects and emerge in relation to observers, to other objects, to situations. I, uh, I want to make sure we, um, we also should take some more questions from the audience, but I actually wanted to make sure we, we address um, one of the questions that, that, uh, that is coming from our groups about, about um, theater and performance, because this is a theater and performance <laughs> conference. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, who knew? Um, and, and you're not all explicitly theater and performance scholars, but, um, but much of the work that has, that's been brought here today that you've been asked to look at has to do explicitly with theater and performance. So, um, so we had some questions about, um, about uh, well, A, what can, uh, what can some of these questions about, the, what can new materialism do for theater and performance studies? How, c how can it specifically enrich um, conversations about performance uh, and scholarship about performance and about theater? And, and then also, um, ca how can we make sure that it's not just a, a trend um, 
to it, it's something trendy to, to talk about new materialism or talk about, uh, uh, talk about objects in theater? Or, or is it important to make sure that it's not a trend? Is, that, can it, is it fine if it's a trend and, and it's, and, yeah? I think it's fine if it's a trend. <laughs> Everything should be rethought. So we think ourselves through this and hopefully we keep thinking something new and different after that. So I have no problem with a trend. Um, I, I think the question of why theater, why performance is a really key one. We talked about that in our group a little bit. I don't know if um, you know, someone else from the group can maybe even say some of the things that we came up with, or should I just go for it? I mean, we, we talked about the problem of, I mean, one thing was simply that the, one of the media, one of the, you know, the medium of theater, one of the mediums of theater is time. And certainly the question, one of the questions about that, I mean, new materialism, surfaces mut in, in great deal of conversation with the sort of tripartite movements of post-humanism, non-humanism, and inhumanism. Those attempts to rethink humanism are deeply related to the, the problem of the Anthropocene and um, the question of an, Im an imperiled planet um, that, that due to, uh, to human and, and humans' relation to objects or the sort of extraction machine of capitalism. So, um, so the, the, the one of the kind of tropes of, of the Anthropocene is that, well, now humans are, are, are a geologic medium, right? <laughs> humans have, 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 have moved, are now in geologic time. And, and so the question of kind of human time and earth time is changing, and so theater is certainly, in, is one medium that with time as, a, as one of its, you know, kind of key components and manipulating time, asking questions about time, moving time, questions of duration, that these seem to be kind of key questions um, for, for these sort of planetary issues. I mean, empathy is the one that, that's um, sort of commonly associated with theater. I think empathy, you, you could also see a lot of problems with empathy, the projecting of, of, the, hum of the, you know, the anthropomorphizing problem that is another kind of mode of humanism that doesn't, um, allow, I guess, for, for, for differences, for not, not possessible differences. It's a kind of possession, a, ability to possess through and this idea of an ownership of self projected onto an ownership of another. Um, but theater also has knit within it something that performance studies scholars have called like liminality, right? So it already has within it a kind of question of relation and relationality, and if, which was your response to the empathy question. So maybe theater and performance are good places to think with, with questions of object relations and subject relations because they can, we can experiment with other wise ways of being in relation. Yeah, maybe to follow on, on that, I, I think theater, one of the, one, yeah, there are many ways I think in which theater and new or materialism uh, can be uh, it can be productively thought together, but uh, I, one way that that I um, that I want to bring up is also the, the practice of creating theater as a, as a fantastic model of thinking through matter, where you uh, the, the practice of of composing of uh, of 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 a, a, a yeah, process with usually many people involved um, and uh, and how new thoughts can happen. Um, through through manipulating material, through interacting with material, and also through materi letting materials have their own um, position in that. So I think um, actually there is there is a lot that new materialism could learn from theater. So. Okay. I, I think also um, to me uh, something that so young you were talking about a lot in, in our group this morning about the, um, the performativity of writing and, uh, and, and how, um, what it does for your writing as a scholar to be more performative um, is, is maybe really appropriate to, to talk about here. I wonder if you wanna um, bring that to the, the whole group a little bit. Well, uh, maybe I can answer that in two ways. I mean, one, uh, that question came from a very practical concern that I felt that there were so many claims for performativity, and I wasn't quite sure what, what people meant. Like, so I wanted 
to people to unpack it and describe and, and, and involve and engage. And also that means actually breaking out out of certain kind of analytical models. So there was a very practical concern there. Like, but on a different relationship, maybe a different way to answer that is that I come to performance by, by film, by cinema, like, and I find myself very, um, it's interesting that, I'm, especially in the last few years, that as a scholar of film and video, I've been consistently asked to like, be on performance panels and now dance panels. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so there's this whole question about the particular material of the live body, and there's, like, there are, I mean, like, I, I, the people I share on this floor with, I mean, there's so many complex, like, and theoretical approaches to this question, but I was very struck by the fact that I'm, I'm asked to speak, like, and to these questions, and, and one way to, to um, and in part, um, I've, I've understood that as in part speaking to the fact that the more dominant uh, convention of the theater with its stable configuration, its black box model itself is no longer dominant. We are in a model where screens proliferate, like, and screens have a different materiality as well as a different relationship to the spectator, like. So that compels, I think, it also uh, it compels a different analysis, like, of what we mean by, like, say, like the spectacle or being in the spectacle. I mean, I'm a little bit digressing here, but. Um, uh, there's often when there's a kind of critique of cinema as this like mass medium of, of, of ideological manipulation. We have that classic cover of Guy Debord and the Society Spectacle and everybody watching a 3D like film and um, with their glasses all looking in the same direction. And what's interesting is that that, that cover only came in the 80s. <laughs> like, and the previous works were at the previous uh, covers actually, if there was a cover image, was actually of people in their apartment, like isolated, like looking at their TV screens. So the emphasis was actually much more architectural, like, and a question about isolation and what does it mean to, uh, to be isolated together, right? So just to, I'm kind of digressing, I've lost my train of thought, um, but that, um, I've completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> I will, I'll get back to that later, yes. Um, I also uh, wanted to ask about, and then maybe we will open it up to, to the audience for the last um, five minutes or so. Uh, but, but I wanted to ask about, um, to bring us sort of to this, uh, this question of, um, of knowledge and, uh, and objects of study. Um, I'm curious about, uh, I'm curious about um, forms of argumentation and what and what the form of an argument does to the the kind of knowledge that you're able to produce or share. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, if any of you can speak to the the forms of of argument making um, that you are maybe most drawn to or 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 forms that, uh, that scare you the most or that you found most productive that you're experimenting with? Because I, I think the, the form in which we, we choose to argue and, and, set up our, and, and set up our statements, uh, of course, impacts then the, the statements that we're actually able to make. with my train of thought, which actually connects you. Because <laughs> you were asking about the writing and the yeah. study. And I think what I was trying to um, connect in too many things was that if the, maybe, if we have a, a new dominant media situation in which we are surrounded, like, and the idea of the, the sovereign spectator is no longer, like, um, one that is quite as as dominant, like what does it mean to be surrounded by the image, to, to have a position where we not so much own an image, but we are bombarded, like enveloped, like immersed like, by an image. 
can we, rather than resist that, and then in the sense of, so do we then return to notions of shall we make a, impose a linear configuration so that we can master the chaos or, or give form to that immersion? How can we extract a different kind of ethics or aesthetics from that immersive relationship? And that's where I was thinking about in the writing itself, as much as we are talking about a more palpable sense of the, the materiality or the objecthood of the object, how can that change like in our in our writing too? Like one that emphasizes the act of writing, the, the performance of also reading. And maybe going back to this final question about analysis and, and logic and argumentation. I mean, I, I love the word study. Like, I want to bring that back like, in the title. And I'm st uh, struck by, there's a quote somewhere in um, Walter Benjamin where he talks about the student, like in the figure of the student. It's, it's an essay on Kafka. And he talks about the student as someone who is um, not so much web about what they're studying, but they are always studying. Like, so they're always looking at a book. Their face is buried in a book. So it's a certain kind of attentiveness, which in which one is beholden to the book or beholden to the library, like, but and one is somewhat in, indeed buried within it. But but he but he claims a certain kind of quote unquote redemptive potential in in the student who is always awake, like and always alert, like and and that particular kind of attentiveness, like of always reading, <laughs> is is maybe something that I would. I'll, I'll, I'll put on the table and perhaps return to later. Yes. Um, that's terrifying to me, but, um, <laughs> but I love Benjamin. Um, so I, I conversely, I, I really, I like the idea of, of attention, although um, attention is of course what we're quote paying all the time. We were talking about that earlier some, in some conversation I was having here. Uh, and uh, obviously we are, um, being, you know, in what's being extracted from us as consumers is our attention. Um, one, one is uh, 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 purchased, right, for one's attention to the video. We, we were, that's what we were talking about, the videos that you have to watch if you're in the middle of something, if you stop in, on a game or on a phone and pay attention to a video, you're, you're anyway, I, now I'm losing my train of thought. But I was gonna say to this question of writing, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about gesture as a way to think um, maybe out from under the clearly delineated so-called subject, so-called object problematic, and gesture is that which moves off of a body or an object in a hail sort of toward another. And so I've been trying to think about the gesture and the gestic in terms of also writing, and so I'm trying to think of my writing, is my writing gesturing, is it making a gesture, or is it, is it also <coughs> composed in responsibility? So, you know, response hyphen ability. What, what is the responsibility of the writing, but in terms of kind of call and response. So wanting to think with Antiphony, wanting to think with call and response, which, which also, and think historically about, about call and response as, um, you know, with Tommy DeFrance and, and Anita Gonzalez, um, a diasporic, a black cultural diasporic mode of knowing, um, to, to name it with that and to try to, to, to think with that. Um, yes, there's Antiphony in, in, in Greek theater. Um, what became of Antiphony is an interesting thing, like why did Western Civ stop the antiphonal? Um, what happens if we bring the antiphonal in? Uh, to, so trying to think of that with writing, what is antiphonic writing? Um, what is gestic writing? Uh, and so making calls and responses, um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do with my writing. I was, yeah, I think in, in your call and response, you're already bringing in both sides, but when, when thinking about this question of, of different ways, maybe of, of writing or arguing, or I, I'd rather, yeah, my tendency would be say, well, maybe we should also learn to read differently. And, uh, and I think much of our questions also in relation to objects are also a question of our capacity to develop different relationships towards that what we encounter. So I think it's, it's both sides. It's because in these ways of writing or gesturing, they invite ways of responding, but we could also start from the other side. And I think that's also things like these this, uh, suggestions, for example, to think of, of certain <coughs> objects as theoretical objects, as, as objects that one can make productive 
uh, for an argument, not in, uh, yeah, in, not in only in terms of writing objects differently or creating them, but also of um, developing ways of um, responding to them uh, that's, that become part of, of uh, producing thoughts and, and producing um, ideas. So I, I guess it's, it may be useful also to look at, at the other side and not only at, at the writing or producing arguments, but also at the openness and the possibilities to interpret and read in new ways. Um, I guess to, f to, follow, um, to follow on some of this, um, I think for myself and my own practice, um, I've sort of had a, I have a split because I'm both making objects and making art installations um, and art objects and writing. And I think what I've been trying to do is sort of bring those two a little bit closer, um, which for a long time I was really trying to keep very separate. Um, I think that for me, the, the way that I see those things working um, in a sort of complementary way is that in my art, uh, my work with objects in art is I'm really trying to let those objects um, do the argumentation in a way, right? Like I'm trying to create some kind of an experience in which um, viewers have some kind of a relationship to objects that I can, you know, allow that to unfold without my presence. Um, and then the flip side of that, I think, is in the writing, because I think that um, what I'm trying to do with writing is sort of um, write from the perspective of being an object, you know? So this, like, change what is the first person, you know, in that, um, in that kind of uh, argumentation, I guess. I mean, I'm even, like, within, within the writing, I'm a little bit more wary of even that term about having an argument. Um, but I, I think, for me, this really ties in with what you're saying about reading. Um, about having a different kind of, um, of orientation toward, um, toward these text objects, I guess, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's gonna be the note that we end on. Um, I wanna thank you all so much for <laughs> so gamely responding to our ambitious <laughs> questions. <laughs> Um, and also just for for um, for being with us all today, it, it's What's really the curtain. The curtain. <laughs> <laughs> um, right there, should, there's one more giant object to present to you. <laughs> you there is car. cheese. Happy birthday! Um, yeah, but no, I want I really uh, thank you all from from all of us from all the conference participants. You have all been so wonderful and generous, and and Sarah will tell us what's behind the curtain. <laughs> I want to thank you, too. There's nothing behind the curtain. Um, thank you, Corey, and thank you so much for this rich discussion. I think we have all have a lot to go think about. Um, but before that, um, I, <laughs> um, I would just like to thank again, um, thank you to not only our invited scholars who were incredible today, but also to every one of our conference participants. Um, this has been an incredibly rich discussion for me, and so I hope that it was for you. Um, and also for everyone who is here in the room right now, thank you for your attention and for your, um, your bodies. Um, and, and of course, also thank you to the Siegel Center and to Frank Hensher and for the team for um, hosting us here today. We're really grateful for you. Um, so we hope that everyone is planning to stay. Um, we have a performance this evening that is kind of the end cap to today's festivities. Um, the performance is by Larissa Velez Jackson. It's called Star Crap Method for Dancers Healing Edition. Um, and that's at 7.30 back in this room. Um, but until then, we invite people who are staying to join us upstairs in the, um, it's room 3111, um, and it's the one that our theater program um, fondly calls our green room. Um, and so we invite you there for a little reception and to continue the discussion there. Thank you. Thank you.